All right, so we are officially starting. Thank you so much, everyone, for being here from wherever you are uh, um, uh, uh, to learn about the struggle of the Palestinian farming communities in Masferiata. Uh, welcome to Partners for Progressive Israel installment, this installment of Conversation with Israel and Palestine, a series of webinars that brings voices from Israel and Palestine to an American and international audience. Uh, my name is Gilly Getz. I'll be your moderator today. I serve as the Vice President of Partners for Progressive Israel. Partners promotes a just Israeli society by cultivating Jewish-Arab partnerships and seek to deepen American Jews' understanding of the complexities of both Israeli and Palestinian societies. Uh, this conversation today is part of our End the Expulsions campaign, uh, aimed to spotlight forced removal of Palestinians from their lands, home demolitions and evictions as they happen in places like Sheikh Jarrah and Silwan in East Jerusalem, in Masfariata in the Jordan Valley that are in Area C of the West Bank and other places. Uh, I would like to take this opportunity to thank our sponsors today, uh, uh, J Street, uh, the political home of pro-Israel, pro-peace uh, Americans advocating for policies that uh, advance justice, equality, peace and democracy in Israel and in the wider region. Uh, and in the United States, uh, J Street uh, brings members of Congress to see reality of the occupation for themselves uh, in these delegations. Very powerful and often transformative experience. It helps uh, J Street had lead the letter signed by 20 senators and 63 representative, uh, representatives, which called on the Biden administration to immediately engage with the Israeli government to prevent these forced displacement. Of, Masferiata, of the Masferiata communities, which we're going to dive into and understand today. Uh, let me mention this uh, opportunity, the two other congressional letters we'll, we'll touch on uh, later on if we have time. Uh, one uh, signed by 15 House Democrats that urged the administration to intervene, uh, naming the breach of the Fourth Geneva, Geneva Convention uh, if these expulsions are carried out. Another one signed by 80 members of Congress urging Biden to get more involved, and I'm going to quote from that 80-member uh, uh, letter that said the increased rate of settlement growth has been accompanied by an alarming spike in settler violence committed against Palestinians, enforcement of Palestinian grazing uh, in farming lands, uh, encroachment on Palestinian uh, grazing in farming lands, and continued investment in settlement infrastructure, all of which exacerbate untenable political situation and undermine the, both the Palestinian aspiration for national self-determination and Israel's own security and democratic interests. Uh, i also like to thank our other sponsor, uh, South Hebron Hills Watch. It's a group of Israeli-American volunteers who are politically active uh, in the U.S. Uh, the South Hebron Hills Watch gathers eyewitness testimonies and videos from South Hebron Hills in order to raise awareness about the struggle of the farming communities in Masferiata, which we uh, are so happy uh, you are here today to learn. Uh, before we start uh, the webinar, I would like to mention uh, our deep sadness and ongoing mourning over the passing of David Sharif, a beloved member of the Partners for Progressive Israel community, a truly incredible human being, uh, and a fearless and inspiring champion and advocate for autism awareness and inclusion, uh, may his memory be for a blessing. We miss him very much. Uh, uh, some housekeeping, you can type your questions and um, uh, uh, as at any time as we go on, and we ask that you don't do it in the chat, you do it in the Q&A uh, Q uh, feature that is down on your screen. You can might have to hover your mouse uh, around it and click on the Q&A, a window will appear and you can put your question at any time. We'll try to get as, to as many questions uh, uh, as we can, uh, so we have a, a lot to cover. Uh, I'd like to uh, offer a little bit of framing uh, uh, before we go to the speakers. We are so, so grateful uh, to have us today to understand the reality on the ground. So, uh, in general, we, we just uh, marked uh, the, uh, on June 5th the 55th year of the Israeli occupation of the Palestinian territories, uh, where a system with two separate sets of laws and rules uh, was created, one civil, 
for the Israeli settlers and one uh, military for Palestinians. Uh, yesterday was a dramatic day in the Knesset. Uh, the Knesset failed to pass the exten extension of the emergency settler law uh, that extends Israeli law to the set to settlers in the West Bank. So they are not governed by the military occupation Palestinians are subject to. Uh, the extension didn't pass despite the large support in the in the Israeli Knesset because of efforts to topple the government. Uh, uh, in other news, the Israeli government has recent weeks advanced a plan uh, of construction of more than 4,000 uh, new settler uh, uh, homes. Uh, on, May on May 4th, uh, we heard about the devastating ruling of the Israeli High Court, ending a two-decade legal battle that gave green light to the military to execute uh, the largest expulsion of Palestinians from their lands since 1967. Uh, this deeply unjust ruling uh, puts the resident of uh, uh, Masafar Yata under imminent threat. Uh, eight villages, uh, more than a thousand people, including hundreds of children, face Im imminent risk of forced evictions in arbitrary displacement in what would be a severe breach of the international humanitarian and human rights law. Uh, the military has already begun carrying out some uh, demolitions and evictions on June 1st, uh, in one day, the IDF and civil administration demolished four homes and two agricultural structures, leaving families homeless uh, in a community in fear of coming days, weeks, and months. Uh, Israeli anti-occupation uh, protesters uh, that included some members of Knesset were blocked from uh, reaching the villages uh, by the military. This uh, devastating uh, uh, ruling comes at a time where we see sharp increase in settler and state violence against these communities as part of a cruel, extremely efficient bureaucracy designed to help illegal settlements grow and uh, develop while making the lives of Palestinians in the South Hebron Hills unbearable in order to force them to leave using demolitions, evictions, and dispossessions of land. These efforts include denying uh, almost all building permits and systematically demolishing homes, infrastructure, water supplies, animal shelters, roads, limited, limiting access to farming lands, confiscating farming equipment and vehicles and imposing fines. And in this case uh, 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 of the communities in Masafar Yata, a declaration by the military of the area of more than 30,000 dunams as a military firing zone, uh, the so-called firing zone 918. And that's the focus of our uh, uh, conversation today. Uh, all this while the Israeli settlements and legal outposts uh, uh, right next door are supported and developed uh, by the state. Uh, to understand uh, uh, all these uh, uh, moving parts uh, in the reality, we are so thankful to have uh, with us two uh, really uh, incredible uh, speakers and human beings and activists. Uh, I'll never forget my first time visit uh, visiting uh, the South Urban Hills and Masafar Yata uh, uh, many years ago. Uh, only 30 minutes, less than 30 minutes from where I grew up, there was a, a reality I knew nothing about and uh, I never knew existed. Uh, I went uh, to an olive harvest, uh, document the village of Susi at the time. Uh, it was under a risk of demolitions uh, to document um, uh, uh, for uh, the uh, Save Susi, Don't Look Away, JSU campaign. Uh, and a friend took me to Um El Khair where uh, I met Eid uh, for the first time and uh, he helped me uh, really start understanding about the, the reality. Uh, we'll dig in today about the communities of um, uh, Masafar Yata. I was there and uh, very happy to be there in uh, uh, April again this year and um, uh, uh, and talk about the uh, uh, what was then a pending court decision uh, we uh, uh, were waiting for. Uh, and uh, Ed, if you can uh, 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 give us a sense, maybe start by giving us a sense of uh, how is this court decision is uh, uh, received in uh, Masafar Yata? I know expectations were low, but this was much more cruel than I think anybody imagined uh, it would be. So 
uh, uh, if you can just give us a sense of uh, uh, what's, uh, what's going on there, how people are uh, 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 dealing with this uh, in the community. Uh, thank you, dear uh, Gilly, again for uh, for this uh, event and uh, uh, hosting me in this uh, webinar. Uh, I mean, uh, the the it's not it's a final decision which we're in the fourth of May. Uh, the Israeli uh, two judges they tell the military uh, they decide that the military can do what they want to do the evacuation of these eight villages in Masafriyata down a bit. And it's, we have uh, 15 villages or 12 villages under the threat of evacuation. But the, the most sensitive uh, situation is about uh, the, um, the eight villages down there is Jinba and Marquez, Halawa, Fakhit and Taban and Tsfai, down Tsfai up uh, these villages is the most, uh, and Majaz for sure, these eight villages which are now in the real serious threat of evacuation like in, uh, in 1999. And then uh, the people is very uh, uh, aware and afraid. I mean, that the military can do this in any time. And uh, the military nowadays is, is chasing cars every day and night in between the villages, even though the people who are living there, they've been arrested and been, you know, detained by the military because they trying to move with their cars from the, from the villages in between. And the road is blocked always by military jeeps and they trying to uh, uh, push the people more to leave without, I mean, real evacuation as we we uh, been uh, witness, uh, I mean, in the, in the past. This is what happened today in Masafriyata. Masafriyata is in siege. It's look like in siege because the military blocking the roads, uh, not giving any kind of uh, right to move between the villages. If they see any cars, they will chase it. They will detain the people uh, for maybe hours. Then they will maybe take them to the police station if they if they driving uh, illegal car. I'm not saying a stolen car, but illegal car. And the, the, the military executes, they say, uh, a lot of uh, the illegal workers passing between the villages. And that's the military is uh, make from it uh, an excuse to arrest more the village movement and the village movement and the people movement in the Safriata. Even though there is a lot of demolition process going and happened in the Safriata in the last uh, in the last months of this new year, I mean, even though before the decision in in May, they demolish uh, at least uh, until last week they demolish the fourth time in these villages in the Safriata in different locations they demolish houses and this is made it very clear that the people in a threat, real threat of, of, uh, of moving from their place. And uh, nowadays, the IDF is building a road beside the, the 67 border. That's not clear if it's a wall or it's a security road that the military built nowadays uh, in, in between the villages and the, and the, the border. And that's, you know, make it more, um, uh, like the military closing from one side and pushing the people from one side and they chasing the cars in the day and night. It's happening even now. The, the military is there between the villages going on with many jeeps and, and military uh, vehicles and st trying to manage the movement of the people of Masafriyata. And uh, this is um, clearing a lot of you know scenes. In the, in the future, the people were very aware uh, and uh, people afraid that uh, this will happen seriously. And uh, even demolition orders is rolling very much nowadays in Masafriyata. Today, the village of Ataban has got, um, I think, 19 uh, demolition order for most of the village. I mean, most of the village got this demolition order. This is one of the things which also making a real challenge to the people's life because these final demolition orders will show that 
the military can come see and we can do uh, do the demolitions in Rio. And this has made the people very aware and uh, asking the people to help them to know about that these communities where they are were living there for 100 years. I mean, in Jinba and in Halawi and in, in Markaz and in Fakhit, in these villages, the people were I mean, living hundreds of years uh, and the military know that there's a lot of documents showing these people is living there because the caves, the caves is very old in these villages. And if you if there's a caves in these villages, that's mean those caves is, is you're digging hundreds of years ago, and that's mean the people were living there. They they uh, planting you know crops in the fields. They have a lot of flocks of sheep, and that's so that the people living there. Of course, the Israeli ID, I mean the IDF say always it's a close uh, military area for training. Nine one eight. This is always the you know. Uh, uh, always they you know um, demand this is for training and uh, Israeli government declared this area in the 80s for military training but the idea is the people didn't see any military actions every day happen like tank trainings or you know mil heavy military training done there it's I mean it's never happened that the military were training every day in between the villages themselves. There is a military training in, inside the green line. That's the military were training all the time and it's real training. The people hear the, the noise and the voice, but it's never happened in between the villages themselves. But last year, the Israeli IDF bring the tanks and just troll in the road between Jinba and, uh, and Bir al -Aid. Uh, that to show uh, that the military are here and the military, you know, need this land for training. Uh, I mean, uh, this is the IDF, you know, uh, uh, um, 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 vision about this area. But the serious story is the Palestinians were living there. And as I said before, and then you see a lot of old, old things that show the people were living there, like, you know, caves and water systems, which very old, uh, old terraces, you know, were built hundreds of years ago. And that show that the people of Jinba and the Halawa and Mirkes and Fakhit and Al-Majaz were living, even though before the 96, uh, uh, 1967 uh, war between Israel and the, and the Palestinians. Uh, this is show that the people living there but uh, we see uh, in the last recent years, we see a lot of demolitions going on. Um, we see a lot of uh, demolition orders, you know, uh, given every day uh, to, to the villagers there and in Masafriyat in general and in South Urban Hills, which really very serious uh, 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 issue about living or leaving the area. And uh, yeah, in general, this is what the, the, the policy of the state of Israel is, you know, uh, rolling here in the South. Thank you, Eid. Uh, and the, at the moment, uh, the, uh, the, home, uh, the home demolitions and the uh, structure demolitions, so when, when, the, when they come and demolish, they just leave the families homeless uh, at this, at this uh, 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 moment, right there. They destroying the 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 infrastructure and they leave the families to 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 be homeless essentially, right? That's uh, what's happening at the moment with this with these increased demolitions. Yeah, the problem. I mean, the demolitions happen uh, when it's happened. The military come and you know take out all the stuff and the families and the humans from their homes, even their animals from the barn, and then they demolish everything they want to demolish because they choose some houses, some structures, and then the military leave without giving any support or aid or help that can give the people to standing. Even though last week when they came to demolish tents, which should replace for uh, houses were demolished in al Fakhit last you know, a month, they come last week and they demolish these uh, tents and you know, uh, damage them that the people didn't use them to stay uh, in a shelter. And instead of their homes, were demolished before twice. This is what happened. I mean, in Al Fakhid and in Al Markaz, the villages, 
which demolished, you know, last week and month ago, and and in the in January, uh, uh, this is the third time they demolished in the in these two villages. I mean, in in a very short period of time. Uh, thank you, Eid. Uh, there is a question uh, here, and Becca, maybe you can kind of, you know, go a little bit into it. Why, why Area C? What is Area C? And if you can give us some background about the uh, uh, the 918 military zone, uh, I just uh, 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 did some research and uh, I found a quote by Ariel Sharon that in 1981, we declared these, uh, this military zone with this saga uh, started. Uh, Ariel Sharon quoted saying, uh, we do this to keep these areas in our hands. So this is like a publicly known quote uh, from uh, the start of this conversation of declaring something a firing zone. If you can give us a sense of the history of it, what exactly is a firing zone? Uh, who decides in uh, why area C? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, and thank you, Gili, and um, for having me, or for having Breaking the Silence, really. Um, maybe I'll just say in, in one word, so my name is Becca Strober, um, and I am the Director of Education at Breaking the Silence. Um, and it's a great question, what are firing zones, because we're in a great position to answer it, because we are an organization of soldiers who served in occupied territories like the West Bank, but also East Jerusalem and the Gaza Strip. Um, and basically give testimony about what we did there as soldiers uh, in order to both show what does it mean to occupy, what does this military control look like on a daily basis, and what are all of you know the wide ranges of ways in which we do it, um, and why we believe we can't do it morally and we must bring it to the end. And of course, what we're talking about today um, is a perfect example of it. And so actually, I'll just share my screen really quick. Um, to just kind of jump into it. You guys can see the screen with the map of it. Of, uh, yeah, okay, great. So what we can see here is the West Bank um, and you have areas A, B, and C. I don't wanna to spend too much time on it, but all of the area that you see that's area C that's kind of like the lime green color, um, that's 60% of the West Bank. And the easiest way to explain it is that every, ask, every part of the West Bank that's area C, um, is under direct Israeli military control. Okay, that means that's where our military bases are. And that means that's where we have soldiers who are settled all the time. You also have soldiers going to other areas, but that's where we're mainly based. But it also means that the military is responsible for all of the civilian needs inside of Area C, right? Now, all of the Israeli settlers, for example, live in Area C. And we're talking about over 400,000 Israeli settlers. But there's also over 300,000 Palestinians like Eid who lives in Umer Khel, who's in Area C, who, whose direct government is the Israeli army, specifically a group called the Civil Administration. And so um, if anyone in Area C wants to build a house, wants to build a road, wants to connect water, wants to connect electricity, wants to have a school, all of those things the Israeli military, the civil administration can either say yes or no, because they're the direct government. And for the most part, when it comes to Palestinian communities in Area C, the government says, uh, sorry, not the government, the uh, military, the civil administration says no. And as you mentioned, Gideon and Eid, you talked about very well, most building permits aren't approved. 98% of building permits that Palestinians in Area C ask for uh, aren't approved. But of course people build anyway, and then there's demolitions, right? And so we can see that this is just part of a political and means of basically putting pressure on communities in area C so that they'll leave and move into area A, which is under the authority of the Palestinian authority. So under the responsibility of the Palestinian authority, right? Big cities like Ramallah and Hebron and, and, and Nablus, right? Um, now, specifically, you mentioned uh, the, the quote from Ariel Sharon, um, which I have it here in, in Hebrew, though I didn't, uh, I don't have it translated, but it doesn't really matter. The point that Ariel Sharon is making in 1981 is, let's declare a bunch of firing zones inside the West Bank so as to prevent Arab development. Yeah, that's his words, not mine. 
so as to prevent Arab development in Area C. And if you look on this map, what are we seeing is a whole entire uh, map of the West Bank and everything that we see in gray is a firing zone. Now what's a firing zone? A firing zone is where we practice. We soldiers, that's the area that we go in and we practice with tanks and we practice with guns, right? Those are the areas that we practice with. Look how much of area C is firing zones. It's 18% of the West Bank. It's an incredible amount. And as Eid mentioned before, I don't have a map of it here, but there are endless swaths of land that are firing zones inside Israel, right? Meaning there are places for soldiers to train that don't involve all of these gray areas. But as, as Ariel Sharon said very clearly in 1981, this will prevent development in the area. Now, everywhere we see that has a P on this map means that there is a Palestinian community inside the firing zone, which was there first. Of course, the community, right? As Eid said, for hundreds of years, if not more even, depending on the community, people were living in caves, right? And there is documented, uh, uh, documents, very, very well documented um, examples of communities in what are today firing zones who live there for hundreds of years and who are even in, um, for example, aerial photos from the British mandate, right? A, a communities such as Jimba. And when we see all of the gray, these are all of the firing zones. But what we're talking about today is Masafariata. And Masafariata is a small, relatively small patch of land compared to other firing zones in the West Bank. But see how many peas there are. There are 12 communities who live in this area. And just to give an idea of what this looks like on the ground, and for those um, who are in the land, in the region, and want to uh, come on a tour with us to the South Hebron Hills, we offer public tours to the South Hebron Hills um, as Breaking the Silence, we would love to take you. And I think this map makes a lot more sense when you see it on the ground. But this outline, this um, brown outline that I'm making with my mouse or kind of following the brown outline that exists, this is Masafariata or what the army declared firing zone 918, right? What is 918? It's just the category number of the firing zone. And these firing zones were declared in the early 1980s. And there are 12 villages within the firing zones. By the way, uh, we can't see it right now, but Eid is here in uh, Um and um, kind of at the top of uh, the map. It's not in the firing zone, but it's very close in one of the 30 villages um, in the South Hebron Hills. And what the courts recently decided was that all of the villages in the firing zone um, down in this area, kind of down in the main area that doesn't have the yellow, are basically under immediate threat of evacuation, right? And we know that this is a political decision. And we know this is a political decision because it's part of a much greater uh, policy that we are seeing to put pressure on Palestinian communities in Area C, such as Masaf Eliata, such as the South Hebron Hills, so that these communities will leave their homes, right? So a firing zone is one way to make it very, very difficult for communities to live, yeah? And, but there's other examples, of course, also, for example, in Susia, uh, where you said, Gili, that you first went to the South Hebron Hills, the original village of Susia was uh, declared an area that was off limits to the residents because it's an archeological site, right? And we know that because of a settler violence, yeah? We're talking about violence that is at this point at a daily level, attacks against villagers in the South Hebron Hills, attacks against people when they're out um, with their sheep or on their farmland, right? And the idea is to make people's life very, very difficult so they will leave. Now, when it comes specifically to the firing zone, it's really important to say, and I don't want to take too much time, but I just want to say how dramatic the high court's decision was. I, I think for all of us who was expecting the worst, we still weren't expecting this. And that's, that's important to say because the high court decision does a bunch of stuff. First of all, they say, the army has the complete right to do as it pleases with the firing zone, practice as it wants. And of course, as part of that, also evacuate the residents if it wants, right? 
which basically means that for the past 22 years, when all of these communities were basically in kind of a legal limbo waiting for a decision, you know, they had certain protections and those protections don't exist anymore, right? So Eid mentioned, for example, that the villages down here, Jinba, Malkaz, Halwa, um, that they're all um, constantly being pressured. Even This is something, even just developments we're seeing in the past few weeks, constantly being pressured on many, many sides around them by the military, by settler violence, right? Um, and by a check post that the army has set up, not being able to go from village to village, right? And if you look at this area down here on the map, this uh, red line, the dotted red line, is an area where there's no uh, there's no fence, there's no wall between Israel and the West Bank. Um, and we won't get into why, but you know it's it's interesting to note that not, there's not a wall everywhere, even though there tends to be a belief that there is. Um, and last month, with um, last month, the past few months, with uh, the uptick in violence, there was um, around that same time a decision to come into this area. And basically, in a lot of places on people's lands, like in the village of Jinba, on their agricultural lands, to basically uh, uh, start shutting off that area so that cars can't pass, right? But it's happening on people's lands. It means that people um, often can't leave to go to work. They can't come back from work. They're often either stuck in the village or stuck outside of the village. And these are people's lives that we're talking about, right? And all of this, the army says, is that so we can train. And this is what um, a training looks like. Now, I said that this was a dramatic decision, right? And the first reason is because all of the protections that the residents had, over 1,000 residents, they don't have those legal protections anymore, right? The second reason is that the military, uh, the high court say in their decision, we need this land so that the Nachal Brigade can train. Yeah, the Nachal Brigade, it's an infantry brigade. Uh, their training base is very, very close to the Green Line. Um, you can't see it on the map, but if here is Jinba, the base is kind of like down here, more or less. Yeah, where my, very at the bottom of uh, where my map is, uh, where my pointer is on the map, uh, south of Mitsudot Yuda. It's very, very close to this area. But on this whole entire area over here, um, on the Israeli side of the Green Line is also a huge training base for this same group. And what does it mean when I say that we train um, as soldiers, right? We bring in tanks, we bring in uh, armored uh, um, vehicles. You can just look at this picture. This is happening in these kids' backyard. This is a training from about a year and a half ago, right? And what are people training on? We're talking about communities who are um, shepherding communities and agricultural communities, meaning when we as soldiers come in and train with our tanks, we are training on people's livelihood, right? We are training on their wheat uh, fields and their barley fields and their rye fields, right? We are training on people's livelihoods. And so to say that we need this area when 18% of the West Bank is uh, um, training areas are firing zones and only 20% of those are in active use, how can we not ask ourselves if this is political, right? And when we know that there is a firing zone just on the other side of the green line that that same exact military unit can train on, how can we not understand this decision to be political? And I don't want to take too much more time, but I do want to just say the last thing in my opinion that I think is perhaps the most drastic um, aspect of this decision. And that is that um, the judge who wrote um, the decision, his name is Mintz, he himself is a settler, important to say. Um, when he wrote the principal opinion that the two other judges agreed with, what he said was, when there is a difference of agreement between international law, right? We're signed on the fourth Geneva Convention. And someone asked that, yes, we are signed on the fourth Geneva Convention. Um, and that says that we cannot forcibly transfer the local population under any circumstances, it, definitely not permanently, right? When that comes into, a, a, what's the word I'm looking for? Disagreement 
with the Israeli military law, which says this is a firing zone and therefore we can remove uh, these residents. What Mintz and his principal decision says is military law wins. Military law is above international law. And I cannot describe how dramatic of a decision that is because if that becomes a precedent in the Israeli courts, what it basically means is that any time military law disagrees with international law and in any moment we can create a military order, right? I mean, not me, but the, the, um, the head of the central command, the person, the, the, the soldier, the commander who is in charge of the West Bank at any moment can write a military order for pretty much anything that he wants because that's exactly what military occupation means, right? There's no democratic process that order is above international law, right? Even though it's actually international law that gives the occupation its definition, its ability to function. But that means that this decision is incredibly dramatic because if military law, uh, law is the rule of the, of the land, then there is no moment in which um, international law can come in and have an effect on situations like Masafiliata, but not exclusively, right? What about Susia? What about Umar Khel? What about Khan Rahma, right? What about every other village, every other community, every other road in Area C or even in the whole entire West Bank? And so we have to take this decision incredibly seriously. Because the fight from Asaf Yata is a fight against deepening the occupation and a fight for ending the occupation in its entirety. This will not start and stop with Masaf Yata. And I don't want to sound, a, you know, a, a kind of like we're at doomsday or gloomy because I'm, I'm sure we'll talk about it in a moment. And I'm very positive as to what we can do as civilians. But it's important to understand that this decision has wide effects on the whole entire West Bank and all of those living under occupation. We saw it immediately, right? There was the decision on Masafaliata on 918. Immediately we saw um, within a week um, military orders for demolitions in uh, the um, firing zone nearby, right? And so we, we see how it's not, we're not, we're talking very specifically and very acutely about eight villages, but we are talking also about the whole entire way in which the occupation functions. Thank you, Becca. And I'd like to add that, uh, you know, a few years ago, the international community, the Israeli society uh, were uh, up in arms about the annexation that uh, was uh, apparently stopped because of the uh, Abraham Accords. Uh, this is the de facto annexation. This is annexation of land that uh, uh, essentially is taken from the Palestinians, annexed uh, to ultimately uh, go to the settlers. So it's the same thing. The world was outraged, uh, uh, again, just going on uh, uh, unofficially. Uh, Eid, we have some questions about what happens uh, when the homes are destroyed are the people get uh, compensated? Uh, do they offer uh, a, a place to go? Uh, a, 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 what happens uh, to to the families? Uh, um, uh, so we have a few questions on, on that uh, uh, on that uh, 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 on that situation. Yeah, I mean this is uh, happened just in the recent last months. In, uh, in Fakhit and in Markaz, two villages, where the, where the Israeli civil administration demolished three times in these two villages in the last uh, four months ago. And the final demolition was last week. You know what they demolished last week? They demolished tents which built it, given as a supply for the families to stay in shelter after they, their home were demolished twice. And then when they when they when they given these supplies of this tent, it's just a tent which heated in the summer and very cold in winter. Maybe it's rolling out with wind. Uh, the ICA come last week with a staff and two bulldozers, and they smash 
and they uh, their distance with with uh, with a dump of, uh, of of land and they dig it in deeply in the land there because people can't use it anymore it's been you mean cut in pieces the, the the metal and the plastic this is an example how when you give a shelter for those families immediately the military came and they say because you built them in the same spot which were demolished twice i want to clarify here one thing very clear that when the Israeli civil administration come to demolish a house, and really the, the court given the, the right to demolish this place, as a Palestinian or uh, the owner of the house, if he built on the same spot or 50 meters square around, they will demolish the same without giving any order. I mean, it will be, the, 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 the last order will be life always. And this is what happened in Merkaz and Fakhit last week because the military came and they, uh, demolish those uh, shelters. Uh, you, you you tell me, ah, of course, I mean, uh, uh, most of the NGOs come to give help, you know, like some, maybe some food, some little stuff to survive, like, you know, maybe water containers or something, like maybe mattresses. But this is not help if the, if the main shelter is gone and the main shelter were demolished or taken from you. And also, one thing, I mean, the confiscation process, which happened here much in, in the south, in the Safriata, I mean, we see it very recently, is increasing much because the military come to you and confiscate your stuff from your home because they say you are doing illegal works. Then they will put it in custody for a while, then you will pay a lot of money to, to release it back. Uh, I mean, this is very expensive, very, uh, um, it's it's a hard you know process for a simple Palestinian local farmers to deal with this kind of work because they can't pay back some of them they can't pay back all this money just to bring back the materials which been taken. Uh, the people hope I mean this will end one day, but it will take time. I mean, Masafriyata uh, now is under the the scene of all the world. I mean. Every day there's a lot of delegations coming to the south and uh, visiting those villages from the from the political level, from the diplomat level. I mean, everybody's you know care, but this is not enough. The people should work more to prevent the evacuation because it will be a mess in here in the south. Uh, thank you, Eden. And that's where we go to our. Uh, uh, to our second part of what can we do about it and how can we raise what the communities are telling us is raise uh, uh, awareness uh, any way you can about uh, what's happening in Masafa uh, Yata because uh, ultimately that is our only path uh, to, to stop and delay uh, uh, these uh, uh, evictions in uh, 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 Becca, maybe you can give us a sense about how is it playing out in Israeli politics and the uh, anti-occupation movement uh, to raise awareness uh, within Israeli society, not just uh, the international uh, community. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I, I want to start by saying that I think in general, um, you know, as perhaps has been made clear by this point uh, in the webinar, we've moved from the, the legal arena to the civilian arena, to the public arena, meaning this is now a case um, in which it's not going to be decided by the courts, it's going to be decided by public pressure. And that public pressure is international, Israeli, and Palestinian, right? And therefore, those are the exact people that are on the ground in Masafiliata, and there is a fantastic campaign that I really highly encourage people to check out called Save Masafa Eliata. And I'll put the website on, but it's literally savemasafeliata.com. Um, and this is a, a campaign that was started by local residents um, from the South Hebron Hills and from the uh, specific villages as well, um, together with international and Israeli activists that had a very, very clear goal that said, the more that people know Masafa and um, you know, as more it's it's a name that they've heard, that it rings a bell, the less likely um, that demolitions and expulsions can just happen 
without anyone caring, without anyone noticing, right? Um, and so within the past year and a half, they've done incredible work to raise awareness. And they did a photo, uh, photography campaign um, that uh, was in the streets of Tel Aviv and Jerusalem, of uh, the faces of some of the residents of Masaf el um, to say, you know, would you, um, you know, how would you feel if this was your home? Or, you know, my home is about to be demolished. Um, and that maybe sounds like a small thing, but awareness is a really, really important aspect of the campaign, um, of, of any campaign, right? It's very, very hard to talk about and to stop something that people don't know what's going on. So that I really want to also uh, echo what you said, Gilly, of the importance of, um, you know, invite, if you're here, invite to, to do uh, more webinars and talk to your Congress people if you're living in the States, uh, which it seems like most of you are. And, you know, make sure that this is a public issue that people know about. And I want to say especially, and I say this, I didn't say this before, but in addition to having served in the Israeli military and as an uh, Israeli citizen, I'm also a U.S. citizen. And so I think I can uniquely say that the place of U.S. citizens and definitely U.S. Jewish communities in this fight is incredibly important because when I was a soldier and I was in those training uh, areas for the Nachal base, um, I was carrying an M16 provided by the US government, right? Wearing a uniform provided by the US government, sleeping in a tent provided by the US government, right? And I'm not saying that the US should have absolutely uh, uh, no support of Israel, right? Of course, I think that, um, it is fine for countries to have relations with each other, including the US and Israel, but that also means that as citizens, US citizens, you have not only a right, but a requirement to know where the money is going towards and what is happening in uh, the name of US support, right? And evacuating people from their homes is not a value that the US government or the US people should be standing for. And I'm positive that every single person or almost every single person in this webinar is against evacuating over at least over a thousand people. And now it's time to make our voice heard. Now it's time to make sure that more and more people know about it. That's one aspect. The other aspect of the campaign, and not just the campaign, but kind of the, you know, the ecosystem of activists that exist um, in Mesa Ferriata led by local residents, um, is uh, showing up. And I'll, I'll say this here, if you are in uh, Israel-Palestine right now, if you're in the land, uh, someone said that they were on a kibbutz right now, you're welcome to come with us on a tour. But also um, there are multiple uh, things going on at any given moment in the South Hebron Hills from um, accompanying uh, shepherds and farmers um, while they work their land from doing work days, right? These are all things that if you go onto the Masaf Eliata website, uh, Save Masaf Eliata website, also you can find. Um, and then again, I'm, I'm, not a, I'm not even, I'm not a part of the campaign, but it's a way that you as, as civilians can get involved. And on the ground presence is incredibly important because in the end of the day, the world will only know what's going on because people are there documenting um, um, you know, um, actively um, working with the residents and um, showing up in the moment of demolition, of potential evacuation, right, of settler violence. All of these things, all of the solidarity work is incredibly crucial to keeping Masaf el and, and all of the communities within it standing. And, and I want to just add, and then I'll, I'll, I'll I'll stop, but I, I just want to add that this isn't a guess. We've seen it work before. We've seen it work in Susia, right? I'm sure, Gibby, one of the times that you came to Susia, they were under immediate threat of demolition. It's happened multiple times in Susia's history, but because so many people, right? Susia is a household name. So many people in Israel know, uh, abroad know what Susia is. You know, we know that Susia at this moment, we're not worried it's going to be demolished tomorrow. Same with Khan al-Ahmar, same with Sheikh Jarrah. Masa Feriata needs to be a household name that we all know about and that we all know we are against displacing these communities. And we are not only are we against displacing these communities, but we are for connecting these communities to water, connecting them to electricity, giving them building uh, permits, right? These are communities that deserve a livelihood like every other community around the world. 
Uh, thank you, uh, Bega. One, one of the uh, other uh, issue that was uh, that managed to get through the through the through the bubble was the increase in settler violence. That's something that uh, made it to the consciousness of, of of the public, and we saw some pressure. Uh, so, uh, Ida, I'd like to ask you a little bit about uh, uh, you know dealing with the settlers and the harassment. Uh, we had a quote uh, surprisingly last week from uh, the IDF commander. Uh, of the Northern West ba Bank uh, uh, a Colonel, who said in a quote in a speech, in lots of places they say that the military and the settlement movement work together. I disagree with that statement. I think the military and the settlement are one and the same, which is a, extremely uh, a, a, a concerning, uh, given that the military is uh, even technically supposed to uh, uh, to protect uh, 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 the safety uh, uh, of the communities. Eid, can you tell us a little bit about recent uh, 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 times uh, about dealing with this uh, harassment and violence? Uh, uh, how is it looking and, and uh, 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 what's your sense of it? Every time there is uh, an attack from settlers happening everywhere, you see the IDF came just and quickly give them support and give them, you know, some, some advices and protect them. Uh, they never, I mean, stop them. In most of the cases, the army has come late after the attack happened and then the army start, you know, pushing the people back and then separate the settlers from, you know, uh, from the Palestinian society. But mostly the army come and take the witness and the the, the ideas and the, um, I mean the the main uh, the main talk the army take it just from settlers and never take it from Palestinians uh, and always the, the the IDF and the police is in the in the side of the settlers standing in every single actions happening on the ground uh, and this is what we see increased very much in the last five years and most before. And that show how the military and the settlers is working together. Maybe I don't know what's doing behind the scenes, but um, it seems they they work together mostly and they cooperate in between. And the the, uh, the army give a lot of protections and hiding a lot of things. You know that settlers avoid from you know being uh, you know uh, covered or filmed or whatever. This is always what the IDF do in the in the territories here in the in the West Bank in general. And uh, yeah, it is work like this. They work together smoothly. Uh, thank you, Eid. So the uh, uh, we we'll, we we're promised to send uh, links to the map uh, uh, you posted, uh, uh, Becca, and uh, to the campaign. Uh, there are uh, also questions about uh, villages that are outside, like we talked about, uh, Masafariata also experiencing demolitions uh, and, 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 and how that works. Uh, there are questions uh, uh, um, about timeline and estimates. When, when do we suspect the military will act on these. I mean, it's already started. Uh, it, it, do we expect them to uh, bring trucks and start uh, uh, pulling people away, or a piecemeal, slow burn to not upset the international community uh, 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 and the American administrations and the Europeans? I mean, everybody's starting to pressure. Uh, what what the timeline are we expecting? Uh, uh, in uh, what type of uh, protest, uh, uh, in, in type of uh, uh, on-the-ground uh, coalitions are forming to, to combat it? Yeah, so um, I think it's important to say that we really don't know in terms of a timeline. Um, and we also don't know if at some point the army is going to come like they did in 1999 and, you know, put the communities or the members of the communities on uh, trucks and buses and, and transfer them out. We don't know. And it's important to say also that before the decision um, um, was finalized, 
there were demolitions happening all the time in Misaf Eliyata, right? Meaning demolitions are a common thing, they're not new. What, what we can say and what Eid kind of mentioned, what I also uh, tried to show a bit is that uh, someone also asked, when you say there aren't any more protections, what were the protections? So for example, a protection is that, um, and maybe I'll just share my screen, uh, for example, for those who uh, are um, visual learners, one second. So for example, prevent uh, protections were if you are in a, a resident of Jinba, right? Or a Bir al -Ad, both of Bir al -Eid, both of them are in the firing zone. And up until the decision in May, um, the army basically was required to facilitate the ability to people get to get home. They couldn't prevent people from getting home, right? Because the, the residents were saying we're permanent residents here. The state said, no, you're not. And the court said, okay, wait, we're going to figure out for a second if they're permanent residents. And if so, basically, do they have the right to be there? That's, that's the main thing of what the case was about, right? It wasn't about building permits. Um, it was about if the residents can basically prove that they're permanent residents and, they're, and if so, they have the right to be there. What the court case throws out the window is um, the concept that these residents are permanent residents, right? Now, uh, we know that these residents are permanent residents, but the state says that they're not. The state says these people have homes in uh, Yata, a nearby big city, and in other places. And therefore, they don't have the right to remain on this land as residents because they're not permanent residents anyway. And what that means now is that when, for example, there is this road between Bir al Eid and Jinba, that the army is now set up at and blocking, right? And Eid mentioned uh, people being stopped there, uh, teachers, for example, being stopped there for hours, not being able to get to work and then eventually being turned back, yeah? When there were protections, not only did they have the right to travel between the two of them, but between the two villages, but they also had the right to make sure that they could get home. The army had to ensure that. The army no longer has to ensure that they can get home. If all the ways are blocked to Jimba, the army is not required to do anything about it at this point. In fact, the army has the right to, to transfer these people out. So when we're looking at what's happening since the decision, right, we haven't seen anyone be, been put on buses and transferred out. And I don't know if we're gonna see that. Maybe we will, maybe we won't. But what we know is that we've seen an uptick in demolitions and demolition orders, right? We've seen, especially in this area, in the Southern part, more and more army set up that actively, is this the reason? Is this the purpose? I don't know. I didn't sit in the room that made the decision, right? But what we know is that there's more military there and that the army in practice is preventing people from being able to get to where they need to get to and being able to get back home, right? If someone uh, lives in Jinba but has no way to access it, what does that actually mean at this point, right? And I, I can't say for sure. I imagine that at least partially, the um, what we are seeing now um, in terms of blocking off roads and setting up check posts and, and more and more demolition orders, right? This And all of this, of course, is to the side of the settler violence that we're seeing in these areas, right? The continued uptick of this, we've all, you know, that we've already seen since the decision. So there's really no reason to, to think that tomorrow it will just end, right? Will there, will there also be an, uh, a forced transfer at the level of putting people on buses? I don't know. I think in the end, it doesn't matter because in the end of the day, if the result is that the community of Jimba can't live in Jimba. The community of Malkas can't live in Malkas. The community of Taban, who today there were 20 uh, uh, demolition orders uh, given, can't live in Taban. Then as someone who formerly participated in this system, I have to say, I don't care how it happened. What I, what I care is that it happened. What I care is that they can't live there. And I think what's important for us to understand is those who wanna make sure that this and evacuation, this transfer does not happen, is to pay attention to the details, pay attention to the new check posts that are popping up, pay attention to the settler violence, pay attention to the demolition orders, right? 
maybe there will be some big kind of a grand put people on buses like they did in 1999. But if not, and everything that happens until that moment, we have to be just as vigilant in making sure that people have access to their homes, that people have access to their lands, that people can continue living their lives inside Masaf Eliyata, right? And so if to give the best answer, I would say, let's assume that there's not gonna be any grand moment and pay attention to every minuscule detail because those minuscule details are people's lives. Thank you, and it's great to see everybody mentioning their uh, member of Congress uh, on the chat and and uh, reaching out to their representative. I think this will be a key uh, in creating the pressure. So I'm glad uh, people are pointing to that uh, uh, in the questions. I also want to uh, shout out not just for breaking the silence, who have been doing great uh, educational and activism work around that, but. There's a whole ecosystem of anti-occupation Israeli activists from uh, Peace Now, uh, Combatants for Peace, Standing Together, Mechazkim, Looking the Occupation in the Eye, uh, Mothers Against Violence, of course the civil rights, the civil society, uh, and lawyers working hard uh, on this. Uh, so uh, international pressure, uh, uh, raising awareness in your community, with your members of Congress is our path forward. This is the, the way we think uh, and what the communities are asking us to do at, at this moment of great uncertainty and great uh, uh, trauma. Uh, uh, so uh, uh, reach out uh, to us. Uh, we'll send a following email with uh, more information and links uh, in, in, in the map and the campaign, uh, uh, media outreach, uh, and of course, um, uh, uh, support the organizations. I'd like to thank, so thank you so much to our speakers. I learned a lot and I hope uh, the viewers learned uh, a lot about the reality uh, that's happening. We uh, keep uh, very close uh, uh, following uh, the developments uh, on the ground. Uh, thank you everybody for joining uh, the conversation with Israel Palestine. Thank you to the staff for Partners for Progressive Israel that worked very hard to put this together. Uh, I want to let everyone know that uh, Partners Progressive Israel is conducting the end of the expulsion campaign this June uh, to increase awareness uh, of the Israeli government's ongoing efforts to expel Palestinians uh, from their land. Uh, partners received uh, a generous uh, 15,000 matching grant uh, uh, to, uh, 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 to, to do this. And uh, we, if you uh, can donate uh, to this campaign, then it doubles uh, your donation. Uh, uh, please follow J Street and uh, help its advocacy work uh, as it pushes Congress uh, to do more, to push the Biden administration and the State Department uh, to take more action and pressure the Israeli government uh, not to do this. Uh, uh, there's a big uh, national J Street conference in Washington uh, coming up uh, in December. And uh, follow up uh, South Hebron Hills uh, watch on uh, 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 on social media uh, uh, and sign up to uh, our emails. Uh, we try to uh, um, uh, uh, give uh, voice to, to uh, uh, people on the ground who document and uh, uh, the residents who do courageous work of documenting uh, these really really difficult uh, uh, moments and realities. Uh, and I'd like to thank you for joining us and for uh, your interest uh, in, in this, uh, uh, in this uh, uh, subject that has great, great implication, not just for the communities, of course, who live there, but for uh, the entire region. Uh, and uh, especially I'd like to, to thank Eid uh, and Becca for uh, teaching us and, 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 um, and uh, uh, all the work uh, you do. Uh, so uh, thank you everybody. I hope you have a great uh, rest of the day. Uh, keep an eye for the next uh, webinar in the series and uh, uh, as uh, things develop and new uh, action items uh, are, uh, will come from the, uh, from the communities or from the ecosystem that tries to bring uh, freedom and dignity and for all the people uh, who live in the land. So thank you so much. And uh, have a great uh, rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you.